if serial killers are not monsters and they're not all psychopaths, then what? Right? What other answers do we have for their violence? As I mentioned a little earlier, for some, the answer to that question lies in a, a narrative of abuse. Right? Some people strongly believe that serial killers arrive at a life of repeat fatal violence because maybe they've been abused throughout their early development. But just how true is that explanation? The truth is this. Many serial killers have experienced abuse, whether that be physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, or neglect. Henry Lee Lucas is certainly one individual who would qualify as having experienced abuse as a child. In fact, he experienced what's referred to as polyvictimization. And polyvictimization refers to the experience of multiple victimizations of different kinds. For example, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and maybe exposure to family violence. Henry's mom, Viola, was described as a mean drunk. She made a living primarily through sex work and through other legal means. When Henry was a kid, she would frequently dress him up as a girl and send him to school. She would send him to school with no shoes. When he came home, she would beat him. She killed his beloved family pets in front of him, and she made him watch as she serviced clients in their home. Other serial killers experienced abuse in their early childhood. Eileen Warnos, John Wayne Gacy, Arthur Shawcross. It happens. But to assume that abuse is this unifying factor among serial killers, and to argue that it somehow is instrumental to their motivations, is incorrect. In fact, in my research with the Serial Killer database, I found that the incidence of child abuse in serial killers, when narrowed down by CCH criteria, hovers around 36% for physical abuse, 26% for sexual abuse, 50% for psychological abuse, and roughly around 18% for neglect. Now, you can't just look at these numbers and start making inferences about the influence of these experiences. Right? What you need to do in order to make sense of this data is first examine those numbers with some additional context. Right? Something like comparative data can help to give you that context. And there's two types of comparative data that we're going to look at. First one is national averages. Right? And this gives us some sense of the, the prevalence of something on a large scale, on a national scale. And then comparative data drawn from offender populations, those who are incarcerated for crimes other than serial homicide. So how do those findings, the one that we just talked about, compare with national averages? Take the 2014 General Social Survey on victimization. It was conducted by Statistics Canada. Now, the findings from this survey showed that one-third of Canadians aged 15 and older, that's 33 percent, experienced some form of child maltreatment before the age of 15. Childhood physical abuse was the most common form of child maltreatment, and that was reported by about a quarter of Canadians. But that's in Canada, right? So what about the U.S.? Well, for that, what we're going to do is defer to the results from the landmark CDC Kaiser Permanente Adverse Childhood Experience Study. Now, this study is one of the largest investigations of child abuse and neglect in the United States. And what they found was that adverse child experiences are unfortunately quite common. For example, 28% of study participants reported physical abuse and 21% reported sexual abuse. So that's comparative data when looking at national averages. But then how do serial killers compare to non-homicidal offenders or non-serial killers? Well, we know that 90% of juvenile offenders in the United States have experienced some sort of traumatic event in childhood. 
and up to 30% of justice-involved American youth meet the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder due to trauma experienced during childhood. In the United States, over half of male inmates report experiencing childhood physical trauma. Now, we know that children who experience child abuse and neglect are about nine times more likely to become involved in criminal activity. And yet, while the rates of criminal activity for those who've experienced childhood trauma is high, serial killing is still exceptionally low, right? Accounting for less than 1% of all homicides. In fact, I think, I think it's around 0.0003% of all homicides. And also, don't forget, there are many examples of serial killers who were never abused as children. Keith Hunter Jesperson, Paul Bernardo, Carla Homolka. These are individuals who may have had traumatic things happen to them, right? Paul Bernardo found out that he didn't really know his biological dad. The dad that he was raised with was not his. Ted Bundy found out that his sister was actually his mother. Keith was bullied, right? But these, looking at the entire spectrum of human existence, these experiences are not out of the norm. They're not. In fact, if you go through each of the serial killer's lives, right, tracing back childhood, adolescence, early adulthood, you're bound to find a few atypicalities, right? But rarely are you gonna find a background so disturbed that one can reasonably make the assumption that this person was bound to be a criminal. Our tendency to do this, to make the assumption that all serial killers have a background of child abuse, right? that they're all psychopaths, that they're monsters, really speaks to the human inclination to find easy answers, simple answers. But human development and human psychology is not simple. In fact, human psychological development is a highly complex process. And we cannot use reductive explanations such as abuse, right? It doesn't work. So how then? Coming back to our initial question, how does a serial killer develop? What are the origins of their violence? And what is the psychology that really underlies their motivations? Well, as we've learned, the answer to that question really does have yet to be adequately explained. And for me, at least, a part of the reason for why that is, is because part of the answer lies in a world that is unseen to us and unknowable to us without a direct study of the serial killer's cogito. Remember, Descartes says, Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Cogito is to think, and it is the intellectual processes of the self or the ego right, that we need to examine when looking into the development of serial killers. To adequately address the question of how do serial killers develop requires an understanding of the serial killer's cogito. Being able to grasp an understanding of the serial killer's thought processes and their interpretational processes has enabled me to arrive at the tentative conclusion that homicide for these individuals is a strategy. It's a strategy that enables a restoration of an overwhelmed psychological state. It's not the only strategy they use. Right? But it is one of several maladaptive coping strategies that they've learned to employ throughout the course of their development. And again, while it's not the only strategy that serial killers use to cope, it is the one that they will defer to in times of unbearable or severe psychological overwhelm, particularly in moments where the serial killer's sense of identity, power, autonomy, and our control is threatened. Homicide is, for the serial killer, a strategy 
that is born out of a confluence of risk factors, including epigenetic risk, parenting style, their social and peer groups, and also the offender's personality and overall perceptions of their development. There is no reason why everyone shouldn't have access to the very best education. Welcome to Calculus One. To introduction to astronomy. The introduction to philosophy. To statistics. Microeconomics. Psychology. Let's get started. 